tardar, pero de nuevo unos a esta pedita broma entre cubetas de pues la de manera tal al norte himno, el himno que nos une a todos, el himno que nos une a todos europeos en actos como este. Que sepáis que no es habitual en esta casa utilizar la oda de la alegría, no es, creo que es la segunda vez que lo hemos hecho, pero nos parecía que era muy pertinente en un acto del color europeísta que tiene la sesión de hoy, nos parecía pertinente iniciarlo con este pequeño guiño a nuestro himno común. Permítanme, en primer lugar, que en nombre del Club de Roma y de la Fundación La Caixa les dé la bienvenida a todos ustedes, tanto a los clientes habituales de la casa, a los que conozco, reconozco y estimo, como a los nuevos, a los que no conozco y, en consecuencia, no reconozco y todavía no estimo, pero que acabaré estimando. Si ustedes se portan bien y reinciden en venir, en todo caso que sepa que son bienvenidos a esta casa, que nos hace ilusión ampliar las personas con las que estemos en contacto gracias a estas iniciativas y eso me da pie a que efectivamente agradezca a los organizadores y muy especialmente al Consulado de Bélgica en Barcelona, creo que la objetivamente brillante iniciativa que tuve con motivo de la presidencia belga de la Unión Europea en este semestre, organizar este ciclo de conferencias que, como ustedes han visto, han tenido acceso al programa completo, es francamente estimulante en, en toda su diversidad. Muy gracias a los asistentes también por su presencia y gracias al ponente y a la moderadora que nos van a animar el acto de, de, en el que esperamos aprender mucho. Y si, me, y si me permite, por un par de observaciones, pues la primera que es obvia, que esto es un acto que tiene un cara, marcado carácter europeísta, si se fijan los organizadores, pues hay un poco de todo, con su de Belga en Barcelona, el Club de Roma, que es un organización internacional eh, a través de su oficina en Barcelona, la Fundación La Caixa, que es el, una de las primeras fundaciones filantrópicas del mundo, la Comisión Europea en Barcelona, bueno, realmente en, en un acto eh, europeísta por organizadores, por las personas que asisten, por el, el, el espíritu que desprende. Una segunda observación, Europa desde mi punto de vista eh, todavía y desgraciadamente porque todavía no somos un, un continente federal Europa no es una potencia militar y, se, y está claro cuando uno observa lo que ocurrió a partir de la guerra de Ucrania no es una potencia diplomática desgraciadamente que también queda muy claro cuando Europa, los europeos y la Unión Europea no es capaz de parar la barbarie de Gaza no somos una potencia diplomática, sí somos, afortunadamente, una potencia reguladora. O sea, muchas de las cosas que Europa ha regulado a lo largo de su historia han acabado marcando carácter a nivel internacional. Y esto no es muy conocido, pero es muy importante. El único tema en el que realmente somos la primera potencia mundial es en regulación. Y no es ninguna frivolidad. Pues el hecho de que Europa, con sus 500 o 400 muchos habitantes y creciendo, espero, regula, eso imprime carácter y acaba influyendo en todo el mundo. Entonces, sí somos potente reguladora. Es un poder blando, pero bueno, pues es poder al fin. Y finalmente, en un tema como el que hoy vamos a tratar, o el que hoy va a tratar en nuestro ponente y moderadora, y como la revolución digital, se requieren dos cosas, básicamente, para poder abordarlo eh, iba a decir como Dios manda, pero esta es una manera muy <risa> demasiado familiar de decirlo. Para poder abordarlo bien, se requieren dos cosas. Una, el poder, el poder regulatorio, y absolutamente lo tenemos, lo tenemos a nuestro alcance, y se está ejerciendo a lo largo del tiempo y muy recientemente se ha insistido en ello, como veremos. Y segundo, criterio, sabiduría, para discernir cómo interpretar y cómo eh, aplicar ese poder a los procesos en curso. Y también veremos hoy, y lo constataremos en unos instantes, que esa sabiduría está a nuestro alcance. Y por eso agradecemos muchísimo tener la oportunidad de verificarlo en directo. Y muchas gracias. Estimado señor Lanaspa, representante de la Comisión Europea en Barcelona, 
miembros del cuerpo consular, señoras y señores, ser compatriot, waar de landgenoten, dear friends. Es un honor y un play para el consulado de Bélgica a Barcelona poder saludarvos y donarvos la bienvenida en aquest magnífico lloc, el Palau Macaya de la Fundación La Caixa. Antes de empezar, unas palabras de agradecimiento por parte del cónsul de Bélgica, el honorable señor Pierre Emmanuel Brusselmans, quien por motivos personales no ha podido estar aquí esta tarde con nosotros. Quisiera agradecer en particular a nuestros socios, la Fundación La Caixa, la Oficina de Barcelona del Club de Roma, el CIDOP, Barcelona Center for International Affairs, y la representación de la Comisión Europea en Barcelona. Gracias por su apoyo, sin el cual este ciclo de conferencias se habría quedado en el cajón de los buenos deseos. Agradezco también al ponente de esta tarde, el profesor Jan Eichhout, por haber aceptado nuestra invitación. Como saben, esta conferencia es la primera de un ciclo que hemos titulado Europe Talks, de cinco conferencias en total que organizaremos conjuntamente sobre temas de actualidad europea. En el marco de la presidencia belga se celebrará cada mes una conferencia aquí en el Palau Macaya. Por tanto, les invito y les animo a participar también en los próximos encuentros de los Europe Talks. Sin más tardar, Cedo la palabra a la moderadora, la señora Marta Galcerán, investigadora principal del programa de ciudades globales de SIDOP, quien introducirá el tema de hoy, Europa y la revolución digital, y presentará al mismo tiempo al profesor Jan Eichaut, el invitado de esta tarde. Muchas gracias. I'll be giving this uh, introduction in English because this is the language that we will be using for um, the conference uh, today. Uh, but uh, please be advised that you can have um, like direct translation and you will have also the opportunity to um, pose questions in, in the last part of, of the debate. Um, you can do it um, in, in Spanish. So um, as has been said, we, need in the, we live in the digital, in the digital age. Uh, Europe plays a super important role here, uh, role here even uh, regulatory power, but also uh, trying to promote the digitalization of its industries, of its, um, of its different uh, sectors uh, of, of, of the society. Uh, yet, uh, this digital age, this digital economy has some particularities. One of the particularities of, of, this, of this era is that the economy tends to be hyper-concentrated, right? It's an hyper-concentrated market. This has some uh, implications that hopefully will be uh, addressed by uh, Dr. Egghardt in, 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 in today's uh, talk. The problem is that these large platforms, right, uh, with well-developed uh, uh, business have less difficulties, for instance, than, uh, than to attract uh, customers, to accumulate data, than smaller ones. The problem is also is that the fact that we have uh, this uh, big business making uh, uh, more profit than ever, it's not translating into benefits for the society and, and for workers. And this sort of like brings us uh, into a paradox, like how, how it comes that this, that this progress is not also bringing progress uh, to, to the society. Wages are stagnant, uh, prices are rising. We see it every time we go uh, to, the, to the supermarket. So we need to find... Okay, see? Okay. Yes? It's better now? No? No? It's better now? Yes? Okay. 
Uh, so we need explanations for that. And because we are looking for explanations today, uh, we are looking to have uh, with us uh, Dr. Uh, Jan Eckhout. He is uh, an ICREA research professor at UPF Department of Economics and Business. He's a well uh, international renowned expert on the relationship between market power and uh, macroeconomics. In, he's also the author uh, of, uh, of a book called The Profit Paradox, How Thriving Firms Threaten the Future of Work. We already sense this paradox in the subtitle uh, of this book, right? Um, he holds a PhD from the London School of Economics. He has been working uh, in many universities uh, around uh, the world before um, landing here uh, at, uh, at uh, UPF. And really his, his uh, work has been, uh, has been um, published and, and, and uh, recognized in, in many important outlets like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Economist, Financial Times. Um, without uh, further ado, I want to call uh, Dr. Uh, Ikhout uh, on stage. We uh, one specific question, what is the profit paradox? <laughs> Thank you, Marta, muchas gracias. Me han pedido hacerlo en inglés, el idioma que une a Bélgica, por lo tanto, uh, de, a partir de ahora voy a hablar, uh, voy a dar la conferencia en inglés. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for coming. So, this is in the context of Belgium being the, uh, holding the presidency of the European uh, Union. And I thought I'm going to talk about something I do research on, but that's related to the European Union, which is some of the regulation that uh, uh, Mr. Lalaspa pointed out that uh, uh, Europe has been uh, putting forward. So before I do so, let, let me try and, and ask you to think of, of the following. Suppose you have a Movistar account with your uh, phone, and you uh, want to make a phone call to someone who has a Vodafone account. And Movistar says no. Not allowed. You can only do that from Movistar to Movistar. And Vodafone says you can only do it from Vodafone to Vodafone. Or you want to do it to Belgium. In Belgium, we have Movistar with a B. Even one letter difference, you're not allowed to do it from Movistar to Movistar. Okay. Second, imagine that the situation is such whenever you go and buy in the center of Barcelona, you go and buy something in Corte Inglés in Plaza Catalunya or in Desigual or in El Fnac. And without realizing, 30% goes to someone. You don't know who it is, but it goes to someone. 30% of everything that you buy, the price says it's 10 euros. 7% goes to the person who sells it. Um, uh, sorry, 7 euros goes to the person who sells it. 3 euros goes to this someone else. That's the second thing I want you to think about. And the third thing I want you to think about is you send an email. You have a Gmail account. You try to send it to, for example, to Paul at uh, the Belgian consulate. I think it's the extension diplobel.fed.be, not allowed. You're only allowed to send emails from Gmail to Gmail or from Outlook accounts to Outlook accounts. Okay. Why do I bring this up? I bring this up because, um, can I have the slides please, thank you. Uh, I bring this up because we use a lot of technology. Okay. If you look at here, I have just a few of the things that we use, know, and are extremely happy with, at least I am, uh, in the way that it changes our lives, in the way that, you know, even 20, 30 years ago, we couldn't even dream of, of many of these technologies. I remember starting with Netflix when I was living in the United States, and they sent me first CDs and then DVDs. You know, this is by mail, and then, you know, we did streaming, so there's this complete changes of how we do things. If in 1990 or even in 2000 you would tell someone you hold something in your hand and it tells you where you are, a phone today, I mean, that's what it says. But not only that, it tells you where you can go. It tells you where to, If you told someone that, you know, in 1990, you would probably be declared crazy, you know? So we have all these technology, all this technology which has completely changed our lives, which I think without an exception has improved our lives. It's not just purely technological. I mean, you know, I have a COVID vaccine there. The COVID vaccine was developed in less than a week. It took a longer time. As Mr. Lanaspa said, we had a regulation to make sure that it was safe, but it, the, the development, the, 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 the discovery of what the uh, vaccine had to be was, was in, in less than a week. This is, this is just amazing because of all these technologies that we have. Now, those technologies are on top of that in many cases, for free. Because if you think about it, 
I can use my Google Maps that not only tells me where I am, but also tells me where I'm going. I can use that for free. I don't have to pay for that. I get this at a zero price. Now, of course, there is no Father Christmas in the real world, or as they say in Chicago, um, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Somehow you're paying for it. You probably have heard the following that if an app is free, if the price of a product is zero, then probably you are the product. And what are we selling? We're selling ourselves because we're selling the information that we generate to the person who's giving us the app for free. We give our data away. Okay, when, you know, Siri is listening to us or any of the apps, Alexa, which one you use, that data is extremely valuable because it's going to be used in some way and we call this data barter. I get something in exchange for my data. There's no monetary transaction. In fact, very often you should worry that if the price is zero, you're selling something and usually if you sell something, you get money in exchange. So you're probably being shortchanged here. Okay. People have thought about ways in which to try and you know, get people being paid for data. It turns out that it's very complicated and it turns out it's actually kind of not so much money that the data that you give uh, is worth, but it generates so much money to a very small number of players. Because if you are Google or if you're Meta, the owner of Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp, you have information on billions of people. Okay, and give a few euros of these billions of people and you're a billionaire. And that's really how uh, this works. But you also pay for it directly. If you buy some of these shoes, they probably have advertised them to you, maybe on your Instagram feed or maybe through your uh, information that you have through your Gmail that's being uh, uh, read. And so the advertiser has to pay for putting those advertisers in front of your eyeballs. And that advertising cost is actually quite high. And in fact, it's high because these firms don't have much competition in the world in which they operate. They don't have competitors for your advertising, for your eyeballs, and therefore they charge very high prices. So Meta, through Facebook and Instagram, for example, they charge much higher prices for the advertising than they would in a market that would be competitive because they have 85 to 90 percent of the social networks market and in the search market Google can charge very high prices for this advertising because they are the ones that basically have virtual monopoly. Now of course if a company pays for that advertising it's not doing this for free it's doing this because it's going to charge that advertising in that sneaker that you have so that sneaker is going to be more expensive that sneaker is going to reflect the advertising cost. So in the end, it is you, the user, who is paying that advertising cost. And so now this free app that you were getting, this free Instagram app or this free Gmail account is starting to have a cost for you. And this is exactly what we see that many of these products okay, that are being kind of sold to you are reflecting these costs that are you know, that you obtain for free through this, this technology. So this is one of the things that happens. This is one of the monetary challenge, uh, uh, challenge uh, sorry, channels, that's what I wanted to say, one of the monetary channels through which money goes from the user who doesn't pay anything to, you know, these uh, large firms. And that's why we see them on the stock market, you know, having enormous uh, valuations because they have enormous returns that come from uh, uh, these, these payments from advertising. There's other things they do. This is one thing that I'm going to call self-preferencing. And self-preferencing means that I typed in batteries in Amazon's search bar. And then what I get for results, well, the first thing on the top left for you is going to be the batteries of Amazon, Amazon Basics. That's the first thing you see. Now, if you're a competitive firm that is offering something that have, is at a very good price to the customer, you probably may be on page 15. So it's very hard to get higher up. Now you can get higher up, and that's the other three that are next to Amazon Basics, if you pay Amazon to be at the top. So if you pay for sponsored search, then you can get to the top. Now Amazon Basics is not paying for sponsored search because it's their own product. And so this is kind of adulterating the competition because there's no proper competition between Amazon Basics and Duracell or Energizer here. So this 
distorts the competition that we see in the market. And self-preferencing is well known to be a way that's very effective for a firm to use in order to increase their sales, so to speak. But it's very detrimental to the competitors. I want to introduce here a notion if you hear say Jeff Bezos or any businessman say my firm is very competitive, it means it's monopolistic. Whereas if you say a market is competitive, it means that it's not very competitive from the CEO's point of view. So the notion of what is competitive is, is, is contradictory here. So now what we see, you can't see it through here. I had a nice, oh, maybe you see it on the, on, this is kind of, we, we see this many, many of these winner take, take all markets. If you think about Google and Meta, they were, you know, very early adopters, very early innovators. They innovated very much. They became kind of, you know, this, the leaders in the market. And because there are what we call network effects or network externalities, basically meaning that if I'm on a social network, what I want is that there's a lot of people on this social network. I want this social network to be large. If I, you know, want to contact people through Instagram, if I want to know what people are doing on Instagram, it's much better if everyone is on the same network. So the larger it is, the better, the more valuable, okay? And so that means that it doesn't make much sense to have two separate networks, two separate networks that compete against each other because you have two half-baked social networks. And so this is what we see as a, a, a social network effect. And network effects create size, create scale. eBay is another one, a marketplace. If I'm a seller, I want to go to a marketplace where there's a lot of buyers. That's, you know, how I get the best chances of selling what I'm selling at the best price because I have kind of buyers competing for it. Or if I'm a buyer, I want to be where most sellers are because that's where I have the most options to choose from and the better prices. And so the larger that is, the more buyers I get as a seller, the more sellers I get as a buyer. So size really matters, again, network effects. But that leads to tipping points. Because what is a tipping point? That the, the, the point at which I'm the first one in this market and I've managed to create this, in this case of eBay, this market for uh, uh, online uh, transactions, then I'm the dominant player. So I had to invest like crazy to make it. But once I'm there, I'm completely shielded. Okay. Now, you would hear in these cases people at eBay, they say, yeah, but, you know, our technology is superior. We are much better than Yahoo Auctions. Yahoo Auctions for many years has tried to enter into this market. eBay has more than 90% of the market. Yahoo Auctions has a, 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 a tiny fraction, okay, a few percentage points. eBay charges around 9% for each transaction, okay? Yahoo Auctions has offered it nearly for free. They said, come to us, you don't pay a transaction, but no one goes because there's no one there. In the same way, I don't want to go to you know, a different social network because there's no one on that social network. I want to be on a social network where people are. That's where network externalities are, and therefore, switching is very hard. If you see how many people have tried to set up new social networks, they're not successful, not because they're worse, it's just that switching is hard. Anyway, eBay says we have a superior technology, the inferior technology is coming from, uh, from Yahoo Auctions. But that doesn't count with the fact that if you go to Japan, in Japan it turned out that eBay wasn't paying attention to that market and Yahoo Auctions was there first. And Yahoo Auctions in Japan has 90 plus percent of the market and eBay can't get in. This just shows that the winner takes it all. The ones who are there first, who gets that tipping point, is taking control uh, of the market. And then the third kind of aspect, which is with digital technology, the speed of change is so fast. And we talked about, and I'm going to talk about regulation, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Lanaspa was, was, was pointing out. And the response to something that changes very fast is also going to require to be a, a fast response. So when I think about technology, I think of a technology in a sense, you know, as if this is the movie of the economy, and by the way, technology is much broader than what I'm going to talk about today. I'm an economist. I'm going to talk about the economic aspects. There's many other aspects about uh, technology, ethical aspects. There's, there's technological aspects about it. But in the movie of the economy, technology is both the hero and the villain, the good guy and the bad guy. Why? Because Technology is the hero, technological change, fast technological change, basically gives us all these things that we were talking about earlier. It makes our lives so much easier, better, higher quality, 
There's so many better things, you know, if I have cancer now compared to cancer 40 years ago, my survival probabilities are much higher today because of technology, because of digital technology. But this technology is also a little bit of, of the villain because of these effects that we just talked about, this self-preferencing, this fact that you don't realize exactly what you're paying for, the fact that these firms are using the technology to keep competitors out, that they're using the technology to basically create barriers to entry to ensure that they are the only competitors, really a monopoly in that market. And what a monopolist does is, of course, extract rents from the customer, it doesn't sell at the price that a competitive firm uh, uh, would do. So this is about the, um, what the EU's response to this in the, kind of in the context of this. And many people say the US innovates, Europe regulates, okay? It's true. I mean, in a sense, Europe is the front runner in the regulation. I wouldn't say that Europe doesn't innovate. Europe also innovates. In fact, there's a company, a European company, that has a market capitalization, that is the value on the stock market of this company, is 330 billion euros. Meta, for example, at the end of 2020 was worth 550 billion. You would have, think, you have thought, well, Meta is one of the big players, okay? Then this European firm, who would it be? Anyone has an idea of who that 330 billion European company is the most valued tech firm in Europe. Any ideas? Spotify? No, it's not Spotify. SAP? No, it's not SAP. It's a firm from the Netherlands, very close to the border with Belgium. We're very proud of it. Okay. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a firm, we call it the Belgian firm, but it's not. Um, it's a firm called ASML. Okay, advanced semiconductor manufacturing lithography. Okay, why is it so valuable? Well, this is a tech company that, you know, in the current demand for technology, the biggest demand is for hardware in terms of the bottleneck of the economy. So if you want to now run large language models such as ChatGPT, you want to teach them, you want to train them, you need a lot of computing power, and that includes very fast-performing uh, uh, chips. You've all heard of NVIDIA, kind of the darling of the stock market at this moment, where their graphic uh, uh, processing units, they've been able, from the gaming world, use that technology to make these fast uh, chips. I'm sure you've also heard from the Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing company, which is basically the world monopoly of making standard chips. All these monopolies are making chips, but there's only one firm in the world that makes machines that makes chips. And these are these guys, ASML. One of these machines, they ship them in three pieces, three large um, um, airplanes, okay? And then they assemble them at the location of uh, uh, the firm that is actually printing these chips because it's a printing uh, uh, technique. It was a firm that was spun off from Philips. So Philips is kind of the light bulb company if you want. Um, they also have a football team, so PSV if you want. And so Philips in 1984 had a team, if you want, a startup team that came up with ideas to develop new technology. In fact, they used quite a bit of the technology from even Belgian companies like Emac that develop uh, chips, but they came up with a new way of producing these chips for high-performing uh, chips. S Philips sold it, spun it off. Okay, now this company is worth more than 100 times the value of Philips, uh, and I'm sure they, uh, they regret it. The point is we also have high-tech in Europe. We have highly valued high tech, and I'm going to come back to that uh, uh, in a second. But we also regulate. And so Europe regulates, and this is what I'm going to talk about today, which is called the Digital Markets Act. This is an act that passed in the European Parliament in 2022, uh, nearly two years ago, a year and a half ago. It had a process in which it was developed. It was developed within the European Commission, and it's basically a set of laws that regulate what is going on 
within the world of digital commerce. It's very broadly defined. In a sense, you could say it's a very vague act. It's written by lawyers. My reading of it, it's extremely smart. It's a little bit limited in the sense that it's only about digital because we have some of these bottlenecks also in other uh, sectors and parts of the economy. But it has a very unique kind of philosophy that I'm going to talk about earlier. There's also another act that you might have heard of if you haven't heard of this one, which is called the Digital Services Act. This is about content. What can and should firms do? So it's more about, you know, is it ethical for an online platform to uh, spread fake news? Or, um, you know, what kind of uh, uh, content are you allowed to, um, to stop and what uh, kind of content are you forced in, in the free speech to, to, to spread? So this is much more about the content, ethical questions. The Digital Markets Act is very much about the economics. It's about how the market works, how it affects the functioning of the market. There's also the AI Act, the Artificial Intelligence Act. This in one is much more recent from the last uh, months of 2023. Again, this is about content in the following sense, that the AI Act is about the risks that uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, can uh, suppose. It has ethical questions, but it also has kind of more technological questions. Can we stop it when you know, machines are going to be independent? Again, because this is about content, these things do affect the economic aspect, but I'm going to focus really on the digital market sector today. We regulate. Remember this picture? This is a picture taken from a Boeing Max, I think about two months ago. This was Alaska Airlines. Alaska Airlines was flying. It was not so far uh, uh, from the ground yet. It was, I think, on takeoff. And at once, a part of the fuselage just disappears. So there's a big gap in this uh, um, plane. Of course, they immediately went back to the airport and, and, and landed. I'm surprised that these people are so calm. I mean, it's a picture, so you, know, you don't know what, what they were feeling, but it, it looks like they're sitting there. I mean, uh, between the fact that it's cold and the fact that you think, you know, if this one comes off, what happens to the other one? You know, so you don't know what that happens. I once, many years ago, had the, uh, the privilege of visiting the Boeing factory in, uh, in Seattle. It's impressive. If you want to be safe on a plane, always sit on top of the wings. That's what they told me there. Because if anything breaks, the last thing that's going to break is the wings. You know? so, and you can tell here. So. Um, so I don't want to step on a plane and start to think, you know, next to me, is this window safe? I want there to be some regulation that ensures that there's safety. That's what the, in the United States, the Federal Aviation Authority, the FAA does. That's what their job is. I'm sure you know that Boeing Max had two crashes, what is it now, five, six, seven years ago, which were basically the result, as the investigation has shown, that they were really not playing very fair with the regulators. Okay, they were hiding information. They were doing things that were not very ethical, and the backlash has been quite strong in the sense that the regulators have been imposing quite a bit of restrictions on Boeing Max. First, by telling them you have to stay on the ground until we've figured out what's going on, and then second, in terms of you know, having procedures in place so that they couldn't continue to do that. There's some people in the Chicago School of Economics who argue, you know, we shouldn't have regulation because the market's going to take care of it. I prefer that the regulator does it than the market because I don't want to be the person to sit there once this thing uh, comes off. And I think it's very similar if you think about how markets work. If you think about how markets work, markets work in a way that provides some kind of, you know, invisible hand, but when they work. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't work perfectly. There's all kinds of frictions. We gave the example of self-preferencing. We gave the examples in which you know, firms are using techniques that are not necessarily conducive to the market uh, to work uh, very well. And that's what this regulation is really all about. Why do we want regulation? Well, we want regulation because if you look at these frictions, these abilities, what firms are going to do is they're going to try and build a castle like this. Warren Buffett was given a talk to MBA students a few years ago, or well, about, in the meantime, about 20 years ago. And some of the students asked him, which firms do you invest in? 
And he says, for me, a firm is like a castle, a castle like this. I want it to be a very strong castle with thick walls, very uh, uh, enduring uh, stones and very well built. I want it to be a, a duke or a duchess who's in charge, who knows the castle, who knows the value of the castle. But above all, the main thing I want is that there's a big moat, a big piece of water around this uh, castle so that no one can get close to it. I want it to be isolated from anyone else to try and get close to it. What he means by that is he wants a firm that is maximally protected from competitors. And if you think about it, any entrepreneur wants that. They want to look for that kind of protected market. You want to be the monopolist in the market. That's the way you make the most money. And Schumpeter, the economist from the beginning of the century, had this idea, if you want innovation, you have to give people a little bit of a monopoly power for a while. That's what the patent system is doing. You can get a monopoly for a while. But of course, what people like Warren Buffett are looking for is permanent monopolies. Warren Buffett is not alone. There's other people who are proponents of monopoly who explicitly say it. I put the Belgian entrepreneur there who explicitly says it as well. But there's Warren Buffett, there's Musk, there's uh, Peter Thiel. They argue that you know, that's the way of life. That's the only way you can make money. Because if there's no monopoly power, then basically you can't really innovate. But the point of uh, Schumpeter was that this monopoly power is temporary. It doesn't look very temporary, the type of situations of dominance that many of these firms have obtained, because they are really long living. Okay, they're living for 25, 30, 40 years uh, by now. Many of these firms do very good things. This is, you know, this is a reproduction of uh, a drawing that um, uh, Jeff Bezos made at the very beginning when he started Amazon. And he was trying to explain what his philosophy of his firm was. And he says, the philosophy of my firm, this is not an egg, by the way. It just turns out to be, look like an egg. And he says, the philosophy of my firm is that the first thing I want to do is reduce the cost at all cost. I want to reduce the cost as much as I can, becoming more efficient. And that's the value that there is in innovation. That's the hero part of the movie. And Bezos has been obsessive about this. And his obsession has made Amazon so successful. And that's why, whenever I can, I buy from Amazon. It's not just I put batteries in there. I just I buy those batteries, by the way, anyway. He said, once I've reduced the cost, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower my price so that I can capture market share. So that's great, because you can capture market share if you make it more attractive to the customer. And then some of these gains are being passed on to the customer. So the customer likes that. What happens is that a platform like Amazon, where there are network externalities, a logistics network that needs very fast delivery, that has what he calls fulfillment centers around the country and El Prat here near the airport, are enormous investments, networks of investment, that basically make it nearly impossible for there to be competitors. It's impossible for there to be two Amazons at the same time because there's only one network in the same way that there's only one social network. And so what happens with an Amazon is that you lower the cost, you make it efficient, but you don't pass so much as your decreasing cost on to your customers as you could, or as you would if the market was competitive. And so there's, again, this tension between you know, the hero part of this technology that allows you to save cost and, on the other hand, the ability that you have to uh, uh, keep some of those uh, uh, gains for uh, the firm. In addition to the digital technology, there's a lot of physical technology associated with it. With it. I gave the example of the production of chips. It's really like, you know, a, a supply chain, the digital supply chain of the production of chips is an hourglass. There's a few moments where there's a, or, or a few instances where there is just, you know, one monopolist producing the machines that make chips, and there's a monopolist who makes the chips, NVIDIA. And so that creates these kind of uh, uh, um, uh, increases in prices for the final product. This happens you know, and is known for a long time in many other sectors. If you look at the market for milk or the market for chocolate, 
Farmers, many of them, very competitive. Distribution, very competitive. In the middle, you have Nestle. And so they managed kind of to control the kind of supply towards you know, bringing this to the customer because there's a distribution network that they exploit. With the physical part of the technology, through the demand for computing power, this supply chain has become a very narrow hourglass. Competitive at some point, competitive maybe at another point, but in the middle, a very narrow supply chain that creates these uh, monopolists. Part of it is just driven by power. People say AI is a technology that's openly available. It's published in scientific journals. So the, 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 the software is there. It's not so hard to actually train a, uh, a large language model. It's just expensive because you need enormous amount of computing power and therefore electric power. Not only do you need electric power, you know, you need basically kind of, or you, you, you lock in people uh, uh, in, in when you have cloud computing, you lock in people because the amount of processing data is so large that there is basically a, not a lack of access to the technology, there's a lack of access to the investment. Universities used to be players in the market for fast computing. You know, we have Mare Nostrum here in uh, Barcelona. Mare Nostrum, with all my respect, but it's tiny compared to what Azure from Microsoft or what uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services does. Mare Nostrum is, is, is a baby now. At some point, Mare Nostrum was a big player but it's very far away from what the big players do. The governments can't compete anymore either. The universities are out, the governments are out, even the military is out. Okay, the military can't compete with what these largest uh, players do. And one of the issues are that we see everywhere is enormous scale economies. On the photo there that I have of uh, uh, the starry night, this is Starlink, Elon Musk's kind of uh, 4,200, I think it is, satellites that he sent into orbit to have 5G from any point on Earth. But clearly, once that is sent into orbit, he made that huge investment. He is the player who made it happen. But that is also meaning that once this has happened, there's really not much competition. There's others who are trying to be a competitor, but at best we will have two. Once his 4,200 satellites are in the air, he has the full monopoly of 5G communication from your boat in the uh, Polynesian uh, archipelago. And so basically, the thing is that there's scale economies in this new technology that's very physical, that is driven, or that is driving the digi digital technology, but it's driven by physical uh, uh, restrictions. And this is something that we see uh, uh, is driving a lot of the, the concentration in, in uh, the market. Sometimes technological progress, <coughs> excuse me, is actually very uh, positive in, with respect to scale. When we look what happened to steam engines, you know, at the end of the uh, 19th century, the beginning or the second industrial revolution, you really had to put up <clears throat> a power factory next to your factory. So if you were a textiles producer, you had to put up a, pow a power factory where you were producing. That was the steam engine. Okay, it was one factory by itself. And then this generated all the electricity for the whole factory. Electric motors came. That reduced the scale enormously. This was a big reduction in the scale. <clears throat> this was a big reduction in the scale of actually operating energy because you didn't need to set up a big factory there. It wasn't as easy as that because even with electricity, you have to get the electricity from somewhere. But at least you could put the factory that produces the electricity somewhere else. You don't have to have it next to your uh, factory. And we've seen that over time, you know, from the 1900s onward, that this technological, technological change of inventing electricity actually reduced the necessity of scale and created much more competition. It took us another 100 years then to be able to make that electric kind of power generator mobile. We made trains and trams that ran on a line on top of it, but for it, it to be in a car or a motorbike or something like that, it took us the development of batteries, which is only very recent. But the point is that sometimes technological progress actually reduces the scale, such as the uh, invention of the electric, electrical uh, engine. 
So let's talk a little bit about the policy, the type of things that we can do. And so <clears throat> people immediately think, well, you have these kind of digital distortions, maybe these firms who say, let's tax them. Usually taxation doesn't really work very well on that. I mean, think about what you can do in terms of taxing, um, taxing Amazon. Well, they have large profits. If you've taxed them, they're going to have less profits, but it's not going to change what they do. They're still going to do the same thing. Instagram is still going to charge too high prices for its advertising. They might have less profits, but the, what they do and where the distortions are coming from are exactly the same as before. So I think the main kind of direction in which we want to go, and that's what the Digital Markets Act is doing, is towards more competition. One of them is the antitrust. The other one is a word that's going to come up repeatedly, interoperability. I have here a picture of interoperability because that's kind of this simple way to think about it. Now I can charge my um, phone uh, because of a, a law again, it's a European law that says it should be the same charger for everyone because then they can basically make you pay for many different chargers which are sold at a very high price. Okay, interoperability is saying let's just stop that game of changing the charger socket each time so that you have to pay for a new one. Okay, and interoperability is it should be operational inter other devices. Okay, it should be operational across devices. And the second kind of big thing that's going to be part of uh, uh, the, the Digital Markets Act is that digital firms are going to be treated like utilities. Okay, I'm going to come back to that. And the final thing I'm going to say is something about the uh, uh, resources. So let me say it. This is Belgium. Le capitalisme mort, vive le capitalisme. It means basically that you know something's going wrong, but let's try and revive capitalism. The invisible hand may not always be working, but let's make it somewhere visible that it can work again. Okay, that's really the idea, and that's, by the way, a very kind of fundamental, central thought in the Digital Markets Act. It's about making competition work again. It's about making these markets more competitive, okay? more capitalistic in a sense that, or in the sense that uh, Adam Smith was thinking about that. Okay? Sometimes the indivisible hand doesn't work, Sometimes, you know, all the best for the most uh, uh, people doesn't come around automatically, but maybe if you push it a little bit, it can help. So it's all about creating a level playing field. If you think about some of these firms that we've seen, many of these firms, what they're doing is they're trying to distort the competition. And if you would talk about this being a game of football, it's like saying there's one team that has 15 players, the other team has seven players. And in fact, the team that has uh, 15 players plays on the high end, the team with seven players plays on the low end, the goal for the team with the seven players is bigger than that of the, uh, of the one at the uh, high end with 15 players. And on top of it, the referee is a friend of the team with the 15 players. That's just a distorted competition. And we see a lot of that because of these scale advantages that this is exactly what's going on. If Amazon says, you know, I'm going to make you buy these Amazon uh, Basics batteries because you don't see what else is being sold unless you s kind of, you know, pay for being at the uh, top rank. And in a sense, creating this level playing field of competition is trying to restore the invisible hand that Adam Smith uh, uh, had in mind. One thing that very often uh, people kind of see separate and is, is, is key to what the invisible hand is, is not just price discovery. People think a lot, oh, what, what does competition do? Well, you discover what the value of something is because you know what the price is. If firms compete, they will set a price. That's really the true value of what it is. Where do we see this? We see this in a stock exchange. In a stock exchange, you see, you know, I don't know what the value of uh, uh, Microsoft is today, but if I see a lot of people supplying and demanding these stocks, that price that comes out is telling me something about what most people think that value is, and this is the best that we can do. It might not be precise. We don't predict uh, uh, the next recession, but we know at the moment quite well what the value of a stock is. And this is more general. This is about the price of butter. If you sell it at too high a price, you don't sell that much. So you're forced to lower your price because competitors force you to do that. And that's one of the central things, price discovery, the fact that we learn what the price is, what the value of something is. But what people often miss is that entry is a very important part of it, entry of competitors. Okay. What was the, really the revolutionary value of 
Uber in the market for ride sharing. It was really, really the value of introducing entry, flexible entry of supply and demand. How does it work? Here we have our taxi drivers. They say, I don't know what the number is, 4,000 taxi drivers in Barcelona. It's fixed. The price is fixed. The price is regulated. What happens? Well, if you have the Mobile World Congress, there's a lot of demand for taxis. You can't find a taxi. On a Saturday night, just before, before going to dinner, you don't find a taxi. Now, on a Sunday, there's going to be plenty of taxis because the taxi drivers have to run around. And so you see all these kind of distortions in terms of the supply and the demand of uh, uh, taxis that are not being met. What Uber did was say, well, we're going to change the price. If there's a lot of demand, we're going to increase the price. But that led to entry. What happens is that I can be a driver, I have a car, and then you see people say, oh, Uber is now paying this much. I'm going to start to ride a little bit because it's now worth for me to ride a couple of hours. It's, you know, between 8 and 10 on a Saturday night when everyone goes for dinner. I can make a bit more money, so I enter. Of course, the more people enter, the lower the price is. That's exactly where the market mechanism works. And this was a beautiful example of how using this kind of free entry, this flexible entry of firms that completely did much better than the existing taxi market. Of course, the way we responded to that in Barcelona, and I think the rest of Spain was to say, no, no, these guys, they can't do it anymore. We can do that app too. We now have free now, and you name it what you want. We have the price discovery. We can have maybe technology that makes it easy, but we don't have the entry anymore. That was the beautiful thing of Uber that's gone. We have Cabify, but the taxi drivers, the lobby is very smart. They said, you have to have your number of cars that you own. So Cabify is not the same as Uber. This is not me driving my car. This is the Cabify owner owning that fleet of cars. And then again, entry is not flexible anymore because they own the supply of cars, whatever it is. They can't just make it enter the market whenever they want. This is just an example that with these technologies, in order to make the market work, very often you have to make entry kind of the central thing. For those of you who have been to, uh, uh, to Stockholm in the late 90s, they had an experiment there. They tried to just do the taxis about prices. It was a disaster because there was no entry, the taxi drivers were fixed, and each time you went into a taxi, you could negotiate. Sometimes markets don't work the way we think they work. Uber was like a discovery. Now, then what happened with Uber? Well, Uber was also at the same time a platform, and then they also exploited that, and we can talk about the network effects that generates other distortions. But the, the value, the economic value, and this is in research has been shown, is the fact that Uber really generated that flexible entry and exit of, uh, uh, of firms. So interoperability. The designers, the architects of the D Digital Markets Act were the people who were behind the regulation of technology for telecom. So the telecom was late 90s. What happened was it was initially a little bit of the Wild West. You started a telecom company. There was the national monopolist like uh, uh, Movistar, sorry, um, Telefonica that later became Movistar. They wanted some competition, but there wasn't really a clear way of how to regulate that market. The market became regulated. One of the central aspects of this market was interoperability. When I have a phone plan in the United States with AT&T, I pay about two and a half times as much as what I pay here in Spain with Movistar. I'm not going to make a lot of uh, 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 publicity for Movistar. It's just it's striking that, in general, the phone plans in Europe are at least twice as uh, uh, cheap as they are in the United States. Because of one simple law, it's, a, it's one line in the Regulation Act for, for uh, 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 the act that regulates the, the telecom. And what is that simple rule? It says that if you have a network of these uh, antennas, then you are forced by this regulation to set your antennas open to competitors. So if you're, say, Telefonica, and there's a, we have the, uh, 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 the Council of Poland here, there's a Polish operator and says, I want to compete in, um, in, in Spain, they can do that. They can go send one of these guys on the towers from Telefonica and they can install their receptors. They don't have to have that whole network, okay? 
of these masts that are very expensive to build. They're subject to very strong regulations about you know, uh, where you can have it, but you can just put a receptor on there. That creates a very low barrier to entry. What that means is that now Telefonica says, there's, oh no, the Polish guys are there. Okay, they're gonna compete for my clients and the Polish company is gonna lower the price. So the only thing that uh, uh, Telefonica could do was lower their price too. This simple rule of interoperability does not exist in the United States. That's why there's only three firms in the United States and in Europe there's around 100 to 150 phone operators. True, they're now also trying to, uh, uh, um, uh, through mergers and acquisitions, uh, kind of create more, more uh, powerful positions, but there's many more operators and there's many more price, much more price competition simply because of that interoperability. What is interoperability? It's separating the network from the operator. We see that also if you go to Madrid by the fast train. Until recently, there was only one operator, which was Renfe. Now we have WeGo, we have the Italians, we have basically competitors that are competing on the network. The network is separated from the operation. Okay. So this creates a form of competition because if the network is kind of linked to the operator, then you have a natural monopoly because we don't want to build two fast train networks between Madrid and Barcelona. It cost Madrid a long time to give it to Barcelona, so you know, imagine two. So basically, the best way is to have one and then on that network have, have competition, and that's in exactly what interoperability does. Once you have heard from interoperability, it's impossible to unsee. Here's another example. What's the difference between freight transportation and long-haul freight trucking, so road or rail? Well, freight trains are typically very monopolistic market. In Europe, they're still typically the networks owned very often by state-owned companies, very non-flexible local monopolies. In the United States, it's private companies, extremely expensive uh, uh, to, to, to ship over uh, rails because these rail lines are basically privately owned. Why is f trucking very often used by pro-competitive uh, 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 scholars? The example, trucking is the most competitive industry. I mean, the largest trucking company might have 100 or 1,000 trucks, but you know, compared to the amount of trucks that are driving around, this is really a very competitive market. You can even have a trucking company with five trucks, okay? and you'd still be able to compete and to, to operate in that market. So why is trucking over the road, highways, so much more competitive than the railways? Okay. You say, well, this, this is the issue of the network. The network that the railways have is owned by this one company and they are basically the monopolies, so the operation is tied to the network. But you don't need that with trucks, right? They just go over the road, but hold on. With trucking, the network is the highway system. We gave it for free, we opened it. This is interoperability, right? We said all the highways are open. Even if it's a toll highway, we pay per use, but it's not that there's an exclusive right that I can say, you're not allowed on it if you don't rear my brand of truck. So basically, trucking by definition is interoperable. And if you make it interoperable, you get competition for free. You don't have to do anything. Imagine that we made the railway lines completely open. It's a bit more complicated because trains, of course, you can't have two at the same time, whereas trucking, it's more natural, okay? So you would have other, there's other differences. But ultimately, the main thing is that Rail transportation is not interoperable, highway transportation is, and that generates the competition that makes this a very competitive market. So, what are the main points of the Digital Markets Act? They basically define what they call gatekeepers. You're a gatekeeper if you're one of these firms that basically own a network, own a platform, where other firms are really not able to enter into this market. So one example could be Amazon. I would like to you know, be shown maybe for the lowest price. They can choose not to show me. Amazon is a gatekeeper, can keep me out. There's other things where there's gatekeepers. Google is a gatekeeper because they basically can regulate access, who gets uh, uh, access to search, who gets highest in the search uh, queries. Uh, Meta, 
owner of Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp is a gatekeeper because they can determine who gets access to the network of the, their social network uh, applications. There's a number of restrictions. There's restrictions on the cross-use of data, so they can't use information across different um, uh, platforms to kind of, you know, use that information to compete better than the, the, the firms that have no access to that. They're trying to protect business users. One of the things that Amazon has been doing and is not allowed to do under the uh, uh, Digital Markets Act is say, okay, you come on the Amazon platform, you try and sell, we see you operate, we get all your data, how you sell, how you price, who your customers are, how you advertise. Once I find out how it works for you, I'm just gonna copy exactly the same product using your strategy. I have all your information and I kick you off. They're not allowed to do that anymore. Okay, so they were using a lot of the value of information that the suppliers had gained from the Amazon platform until Amazon said out. Okay, I'm gonna do this. So that's gonna be uh, uh, not allowed. There's strict rules against self-preferencing, the example I gave about who you put uh, on top. Pre-installation, Remember, there was the browser wars. Microsoft got uh, uh, into a, a, a legal fight in the late 90s because of uh, 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 them imposing the, um, the Explorer uh, uh, browser. There's now things like that that are a result of that. If you use an iPhone and you go on the Apple Maps and you say, give me the driving directions, it asks you, do you want this in Google Maps or do you want this in Apple Maps? Apple doesn't like to do that. They're forced to do that. Okay, and this basically changes you know, the, the, the competition. You say, I don't care, you don't care, but your advertising cost is gonna change through this. And then there's bundling that you're forced to consume certain things only of the same brand. It's like the, you know, you're only allowed on a, a road where, where you have the truck of the, 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 the same brand. And finally, there's the whole issue of interoperability. Interoperability is a very central theme in the Digital Markets Act. Portability, portability of Accounts and data, like with your bank account, you can go from one bank to the other. They cannot say, oh, no, you can't take out your money. Or remember in telecom, in the beginning, it was very difficult to change from Telefonico to, to Vodafone. You said, yeah, but you lose your number. You say, ah, but all my friends have my number. They were trying to do that. So this portability made it easier. This portability requirement made it easy for uh, people to use all these uh, uh, different providers or to have access to these different providers. In fact, the providers have to make it technically easy for you. They have to do the work okay, to uh, uh, give you access. And then there's also the right to data access by both business users and end users. Okay, so you have the right to access the data that you generate. In the example I gave from Amazon, the Digital Markets Act is gonna say, well, you, you have right to the access that they know Amazon knows about you, you have access to that uh, data. That's in a nutshell what the kind of the, the, the legal uh, issues is. There's something very new in what we're gonna call competition policy. One is now what we're doing is very different from what's being done until the Digital Markets Act. This is still gonna exist. What's done now is what we call ex post enforcement. We have a wonderfully successful Belgian firm called AB InBev, it's the beer brewers of all the Belgian beers that you probably know. What they did from the 1980s until now was have new mergers and they bought another firm and they bought another firm, became bigger and bigger. So they grew, not what we call through organic growth, that is you build new factories, they just bought other factories. The merger review says, okay, let's take a look at, does this create a dominant position? And so sometimes when you have a merger review, for example, the siemens alstrom attempt of merger uh, about four years ago was blocked because it was considered that it was gonna create too much market power in the construction of mainly trains and, uh, uh, um, and things like that. And so this merger review is something that you try and do a merger and then expose they say, let's see whether you're allowed to do this. What the Digital Markets Act does is actually doing it much earlier. It's what we call ex ante regulation, not exposed enforcement. So we're gonna say ex ante, these are a set of principle by which you have to abide. And they're gonna treat effectively the firms, these gatekeepers, these platforms, they're gonna treat them just like utilities. What is a utility? Water, electricity, transportation, telecom. These are sectors that are highly regulated, that are regulated by the fact that there's a set of rules. 
Electricity provision, by definition, is a natural monopoly. If you have a kind of a power plant in a certain location, it's very costly to transport electricity over large distances. So it doesn't make sense to have you know, competition in power plants in the same way that it doesn't make sense to have competition in railway lines next to each other. So energy, therefore, is regulated. We have a regulated market of how it's priced. There's, a com there's competition, by the way. There's an invisible hand. But it's done through a set of rules. You can't just exploit your market power, your dominant position, which we saw, by the way, in Texas. I don't know if you remember that. About two years ago, they had a snowstorm. And Texas, true to its values, had a very competitive market in the uh, uh, utilities for electricity. What happened there was that at some point, you know, one kilowatt was worth $2,000. Okay, so there's basically just a spike in prices because there was no supply. The installations had collapsed. And so they had this huge kind of disequilibrium in the price, but there was no regulation. Okay, and this created all kinds of distortions because this is by itself not a competitive market. You have to make it competitive such that there is a, a, a competition on it. We talked about transportation and telecom. One thing about the digital market sector is that there is no judges who are going to sit there and say, okay, let me now think, you did this merger, let me see whether it is good or bad. That's still going to exist, as I said. But now they're going to say, you are a player, maybe you are a competitor of, say, Amazon, or you're a competitor of Google or Apple. You can go to a judge now and you can say, hold on, this firm isn't... Uh, uh, kind of uh, satisfying the interoperability requirements or they have self-preferencing. So you don't really need the same type of government that says, let me just check is a merger good or bad. You allow the players themselves to go through it. In a sense, it looks very much like it's taking the judicial power not out of it, but the judicialization out of it. It's a kind of a form of de-judicializing because there's a lot of kind of arbitraging and negotiating going on in order to make sure that they abide by the rules rather than say, I'm going to do this, and then you check me, expose them, we go to the judge. So there's much less of a judicial component to that. There's also what I'm calling a de-expertization of the procedures. What does that mean? Well, the way it works now with this exposed enforcement, kind of the, the traditional view of competition policy, the way that works is that you bring in experts. It could be an engineer, it could be a physicist, it could be an economist if it's about the market. It could be any type of uh, uh, kind of experts on, on, on any given topic. But of course, this is a very costly procedure. Moreover, the firms use this procedure as a way to, um, how is it to stall and to delay some of these actions. For example, Apple was on the kind of uh, in a case for once for iPad, once for uh, the iPhone. And they basically had to repeat the whole procedure of arguing what the non-competitive aspects were from the operating system from iPad and iPhone. So this was just doubled up. They're the same operating system. I mean, there's small differences, but what you have with these kind of exposed enforcement is that you, you basically have to invent the wheel multiple times. And ultimately, you get a lot of discussion with this exposed enforcement about, you know, he said, she said. For example, they talk a lot about how big the market is, how many firms are in there. And then Google says, of course, this is a huge market because search, there's also, you can search on LinkedIn, you can search on WhatsApp, you can, the search market is huge. But that's not what most people think of what the search market for you know, the product that Google makes. How many browsers are, are there? There's probably Google and Bing, and Bing has a tiny share, and the rest is to Google. So then they have a discussion, no, no, but what is the search market? And this is, again, a very lengthy uh, uh, debate, because Google, if they can show that the search market is all these firms, then it's very competitive. Whereas if it's very specific to one or two firms, then they have a dominant position, and this affects the ruling of the, uh, of the, uh, the judges. This ex post enforcement is a huge business. All these consulting firms that are around, it's about one billion just in the uh, uh, European Union. So this is, a, this is big business. You, I mean, you know, what the Digital Markets Act potentially is going to do is reduce kind of the need for those businesses. So you might see some people that knock on your door to look for jobs at some point. Good. 
What do we expect on the 9th of March? The Digital Markets Act becomes, you know, it's already voted. It's already active in the sense that there's negotiations going on. But the 9th of March is the end of the trial period. Then they have to implement it. One of the things that's going to happen is that you'll be able to send a message from your WhatsApp account to an Insta to a um, Telegram account, for example. So interoperability now means that you'll be able to send messages to different, uh, um, different messaging services. What is this going to mean? Well, to most people, this doesn't mean anything because they all use WhatsApp anywhere. But what's going to happen is that this is now going to give rise to many more operators entering to the market. There's now going to be many more messaging services because it doesn't matter that I'm a WhatsApp user. I can send from WhatsApp to, you know, uh, if, if it were the case that the Belgian consulate started a messaging service, you could do that. Okay. In the same way that I can call from my Movistar account to my Mobistar account friend in Belgium or to the Vodafone account. In the same way that I can send an email from my Gmail account to the diplowell.fed.be account from the consulate. So this is creating basically entry of more players. Entry of more players is going to offer these services at a lower price. You say you don't pay for WhatsApp, but remember the advertising. So this is going to create a form of uh, uh, competition. Is it going to break the advertising monopolies? I'm not sure. So these are a number of things where I'm you know, not sure how effective the digital markets acts will be. Will it break the physical bottlenecks? You know, remember our Dutch firm that produces the, uh, the, the, the um, chips, sorry, the machines that make the chips. Is it going to break that bottleneck? I don't think the digital markets act will be able to do that. Um, will there be competition in cloud computing? Again, it's all about physical scale, access to power, access to enormous amount of computing uh, uh, um, resources. I don't think that the Digital Market Act will be able to uh, break those bottlenecks. Security is often used as an excuse. You might not know this, but I was kind of saying, you know, I can send an email from, say, my Gmail account to the account of the, uh, uh, the consulate. I think the consulate is an exception because they have high security. But for example, at my university, I have a upf.edu account, but it's actually Gmail. Why is it Gmail? Why did we go with Gmail? Well, UPF has been hacked badly recently, so they really had a good reason to someone that they trusted. But there's another reason. Gmail doesn't allow you to receive emails anymore from just your own little uh, internet service providers. There's only really three providers anymore. It's Gmail, it's Outlook uh, from Microsoft, and it's Yahoo. All the rest is being blocked. They argue security. They argue that there's all these bots that are being generated from these little servers, and we can't kind of distinguish between the ones that are true and the ones that are false. And so therefore, we only allow from Outlook and from Yahoo and from Gmail between each other. There's interoperability, but they argue that security is the reason why they can't honor inter interoperability. I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. I'm not sure whether this is going to, you know, introduce again the, uh, uh, the, the, the presence of uh, email providers, internet service providers. Remember that until five years ago, university, your company had their own kind of servers, and it's actually very easy to set up a server to send email. Okay? They were basically the internet service provider for your job. Today, probably your company, your uh, 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 um, employer is using one of these three uh, providers. So we'll see what happens with that. And then finally, this is the digital market sector. There's other sectors where we have very similar issues. Are these going to be affected? Many of these sectors are also driven by technology. It's interesting to see, for example, a firm that's quite dominant in the textiles market, uh, uh, such as Inditex. Inditex is heavily using technology. They're using artificial intelligence to measure the preferences of their customers. They have a very sophisticated logistics system that's comparable to what uh, uh, Amazon does. So the question is, is this going to have also effects on the not so digital sectors who use digital technology to create these uh, uh, dominant positions? Overall, I think there's very good news. There's going to be changes that you don't see in the same way that I don't want to know why the Boeing Max is safe, 
I just want it to be safe. I just want it to be competitive in this case. I don't need to know why it is. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to happen, you know, under the covers of uh, 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 this digital world that we don't know. But there's going to be, you know, entry of firms. There's going to be competition. There's certain things that we will see. One of the things that you will see is that now, if you go to the uh, uh, Apple App Store or Google Play, now they... I'm sure you're aware, or maybe you're not, whenever you download something that has a price that's not for free, you pay 30% to Apple or to Google. They cannot uh, stop that, so they can charge that the same way, but now if you download it, they have to offer, do you want to download this directly from Spotify, or do you actually want to download it from the Apple Store? And so now you have the option to get it from somewhere else, and now Spotify is probably going to say, if you get it from us, Rather than me paying the 30% to Apple, I give you a, a, a discount. This is going to create competition. So you're going to have, if everything works well, there's going to be an option. Do you want to download it from the original provider? And they probably might even have to put the price on it. This is going to be all depending on how this is going to be uh, implemented. You're also going to be able to see app stores that are not Apple or Google Play on your phone. That's going to be allowed. So if someone says, I make a deal with uh, Spotify, instead of making Spotify pay 30% to be on my phone, I'm going to say I'll do it for 2%. Okay? And these, these uh, uh, new app stores are going to be able to compete with the Apple App Store and with Google Play. So you'll see a number of changes. As I said, most of the changes you won't see, but it should have an effect on the competitiveness of these uh, uh, markets. Good. Um, let me just say one last thing. Um, in terms of resources, this is probably the sore point of the Digital Markets Act. It's like the, 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 in part of the, the problem of, of the EU itself, or at least the European Commission, that you know, the European Commission has such a bad reputation of having such a, a, a cost in terms of, of the bureaucracy. Of course, it's a lot smaller than the social security uh, that we have, for example, for the whole of Spain. The whole European Commission is much smaller in terms of the number of uh, uh, employees. And so they don't have much of a budget. Just to give a comparison, if you look at the amount of money that's being spent on enforcement of low inflation, so the independent central bank that we have in Frankfurt or in the United States, the Federal Reserve Bank, that's roughly about 5 billion euros for what? Well, there we get a gain of around 0.5% of GDP. That's what economists calculate, what the gain is from really running an inflation-free economy. Okay, Inflation-free, 2%, as you know. Sometimes we get the bottlenecks and the war in Ukraine and inflation uh, shoots up. But look, the central banks did a good job. Within two years, they got the inflation down. So with 5 billion, you implement that policy and you gain on roughly about half a percent of GDP from not having the inflation that Argentina has, for example. If you look at competition policy, competition policy receives about one-tenth of this, okay, about half a billion. Now, most estimates of the cost of the excess of dominance, the lack of competition, is around 8% of GDP. So we get a tenth of something that's eight times bigger, sorry, eight, no, uh, 16 times bigger than uh, uh, what control or, or uh, effective monetary policy does. So it seems that there's really not enough resources to implement this. And the, the, the digital market sector is no different in that. Everything that the politician says, it's not going to cost more. But of course, they now will need more coders. They will need AI specialists. They will need specialist engineers to be able to evaluate certain aspects of the technical uh, uh, side of it. And that may be a weakness of the digital market sector. Good. I'm going to skip this because I'm out of time. This too, I mean, Girona and common ownership, just quickly, there's one issue that the digital markets like, hasn't got anything to say. It's a financial thing. You might have heard that if Girona were to play uh, Champions League, they might be banned because they're owned by Manchester City. So you can't have two teams that are owned by the same owner to play in the same competition. Okay. They'll find a way out. It happened to Red Bull Salzburg and Red Bull uh, Leipzig. They found a way out by changing the ownership structure. So they, they will find a way. Um, but you can see that it adulterates the competition. You can see that it, it kind of changes the competition in some way, right? Because you know, we know that in Formula One, the two drivers, they kind of do it in a way they, they hear that they have to do it one way or the other, not in the most competitive way. And so you can see that this, this has an effect on the competition. 
I sometimes wonder, you know, if this is so worrisome, why don't we see Florentino do this? You know, why doesn't he own more teams to just adulterate the competition? I guess for him it's cheaper to just own the VAR. No, that's going to work much better. So. Um, good, that's on common ownership. This happens with firms too. There's a lot of evidence that if you have one firm, say BlackRock, which is a financial firm, that owns two firms that compete. For example, they own Delta and United in the United States. Prices on flights on these routes where they compete are much higher than if there's no such common ownership. Okay, common ownership is one source of creating lack of competition, even it looks like I have two choices. These days, you know, the retail of cars, you know, especially in the United States, to some extent in Europe, so if I go to a car dealer, say I wanna buy, you know, a nice car, I wanna buy a BMW, and I say, I don't like the price, it's a bit too high. Let me take a look at what Audi offers. I go to Audi, they say, well, same thing, can I bargain? No, no bargain. Turns out that the owner of these two dealerships is the same person. Okay, so this common ownership is kind of another way to stifle competition. It's not just in, uh, in the Champions League. Good. Um, I'm going to skip this because I don't want to hold you up. This is my last slide. I just want to say one thing about this. Ultimately, many of these firms that are active, that we see in operation, are global firms. These are firms that are basically selling around the world, maybe in some cases not in China because of the certain restrictions that there are in China, but virtually everywhere, okay? Google is around the world. Uh, Meta, Facebook, and uh, Instagram, WhatsApp is around the world. Everyone uses them. Apple is produced and sold and used around the world. These are all global companies. Now, people ask, is this something about, you know, the US? Do we not have this in Europe? Ultimately, what matters is not where the postal address is of the company. What matters is where the customer is. That's the only thing that matters. And the Digital Markets Act is actually about that. Whether you're using Apple or Google or Booking.com, which is a, a Dutch company, it doesn't matter, okay? It matters where the customer is, not where their address is. And there's plenty of examples of these firms that, you know, our booking, by the way, is now uh, mainly active financially in the United States because they have access to financing there much better than the access that they have uh, uh, in, in Europe. So it doesn't really matter if they change their postal address. What matters is, is where the customer is. By the way, people say America is different. In Alabama, there's no tech. Even in California, except for the Bay Area, there's a lot, a lot of parts of California where there's no tech. So ultimately, even you know more... Granularly, granularly, the closer you get, this idea that tech is from a certain country or even area or even city is by itself also uh, uh, not very kind of informative. What matters is really where the, um, where the customer is. We see more globalization going on at the level of uh, uh, these, uh, uh, these products. People talk we have to stop that globalization. I think I would like to argue we need more globalization, not less. More in the sense that we need institutions that can attack or at least address these problems that arise because of these dominant firms. So maybe instead of thinking we should stop this globalization business, maybe what we would like to do is to have more globalization at the level of a DMA, at the level of making sure that the invisible hand works globally making sure that there is competition between these firms at a global level. We're very far from that. The DMA is exceptional in the sense that it's well about 400,000, sorry, 400 million people, okay, but at a global level, Europe is still a small player relative to the rest of the, uh, the world. And so, in a sense, you know, this is one step. It's remarkable, I think, as an outcome, and the potential is high. There is something very positive about this, and it may well be, you know, there's a risk. And I talked to the lawyers who designed the DMA, and they said, well, one of the things that we were worried about is that maybe Apple says we stop operating in Europe. You know, if you impose those law, we don't, we're not interested. The market is, for them, still big enough. But similar things have happened in the United States as well. California is more restrictive in their regulation on digital uh, uh, products. And so what 
tends to happen is that if California imposes a strict, stricter piece of legislation, the companies say, OK, if we have to do it in California for 60 million people, we're going to do it for the rest of the US. We're not going to make two kind of versions of it because this is going to be much more complicated. And so this had the effect of kind of, you know, a contagious effect, if you want, of this regulation towards the rest uh, of the world. And many people anticipate that this is going to happen. So if, if WhatsApp opens up to, in, uh, to, to Telegram and all the other uh, uh, messaging providers, what's the likely thing is going to happen is that you're going to also be able to do that in the United States, even though the Digital Markets Act doesn't apply in the United States. But otherwise, for them to make it separate for an same device, I go to the United States, and then they have to see my IP address, and they have to decide that I can or cannot message to someone from Instagram, from WhatsApp, sorry, from um, to uh, Telegram from WhatsApp, will be probably more uh, complicated. I'm going to leave it here. Um, thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat>